There's something special about the day. Is it Groundhog Day? <laughs> it feels like it, doesn't it? We're getting the 9-11 <clears throat> fake story over and over and over, 17 years worth. You know, I remember... Uh, I remember asking this out loud when before I realized what was going on. Why do they keep showing that one plane uh, it, uh, that hit the South Tower? Why do they keep showing that over and over and over again? I didn't realize that I was being programmed, brainwashed, as it were. Um, <clears throat> so I asked, you know, later I answered my own question, I guess. But I, uh, I just kept asking, why do they keep showing that? Do you guys remember how often... They showed that, but yet in a city of what, 20 million, I'm assuming, eh, something like that. Listen, if you go near your airport, any international airport, and watch even a 767 or a 737 come in for a landing, you can see it for a long ways. And not one person noticed that this airplane's like never, you know, these things are not flying in their normal path. What the heck? They heard sounds. They heard maybe a missile. They heard something that didn't sound like a plane. Uh, but nobody saw the first plane. The second plane they kept showing us over and over. But one thing they did do is they stopped showing us the interview with the eyewitnesses that were down below that told us it wasn't a commercial plane. Remember that? Well, you know, one thing that has to happen in order for an airplane to hit a target that's, you know, a thousand feet, it has to fly at a thousand feet for quite a while yeah. in order to do that. I mean, it can't just come down from 5,000 feet or you would have seen the plane, uh, you know, if they actually had a, a real film of it, uh -huh. you would have seen it coming dive down bombing. and it wasn't dive bombing, <laughs> it was coming in. And that in order to do that, that's a very low altitude, a thousand feet for a plane to, you know, a, a big plane like that to fly. And you didn't see that. And nobody saw that. That's true. Just for maybe the last <clears throat> five or 600 yards. If anybody saw anything. And there's hardly anyone that saw anything. Now, there's stuff that uh, came out on the police scanner to the, you know, uh, 911 call in to the dispatchers. That people were saying that they they thought they saw missiles being launched from the Woolworth building or that vicinity. So anyway, this is September 11th, 2018. And in lieu of your daily news show, we're going to just sit around. Uh, Ramjet and I, we're going to talk about 9-11. I don't know how long this is going to go. After it gets pulled off the daily show thing, it will be put on... Um, somewhere in the free videos so uh you know or not the free videos but in somewhere into that 9-11 truth or the galley talking interviews or something somewhere there so you can find it because we're going to talk about how these books came about so the fact that the government is just bloviating still again and another year later about what happened or really what didn't happen it kind of is like groundhog day it is. That's why I was kind of laughing when you <laughs> when you said that, because it's like it is. It's over and over and over. And now what's interesting to me, because I really went down the groundhog hole, <laughs> the rabbit hole. Um, and what I've discovered that's in the fourth book now, um, by the way, almost, well, quite frankly, uh, almost every a character that you meet in book four is real. I just change things about them so you don't know who they are. Mary Carter, by the way, just so you know, if you haven't read yet, that's okay. Just remember this. Mary Carter is not her real name. Uh, her story is very real. Uh, her location is not real. Um, but her story is real. The dates and the timelines and who is involved are real. Uh, but Mary Carter paints is a CIA front company from years ago. You can Google search Mary, Mary Carter Paints, and you'll probably find out it's a CIA front company. But uh, that was just kind of an in-your-face thing because of the CIA uh, stuff. And in a sense, it's a in-your-face to the trolls that came out and thought that my... Uh, now, my computers are all based on <clears throat> proxy servers, so I'm about four or six or more uh, states away from where my real location is has to be that way. <clears throat> and why is that? Because people started 
uh, in the trooper movement, uh, started looking up my IP address that was attached to me and <clears throat> making claims that I was <clears throat> out of Langley, Virginia. So I was a CIA agent. And there are people like Jim Fetzer and some other lunatics online that claim I'm a CIA, my husband's NSA. And it's just complete insanity. And uh, l listen, I, if you sniff around my IP address, guess what? You're going to find it goes all over because it's not ever where I am physically. <laughs> well, I remember early on, I think I think it was a Facebook account of yours. You put actually that you were in Langley, Virginia, and people believe that. Yeah, I did because somebody had already accused me of being a CIA. So I just facetiously went in there and <laughs> posted and my location was Langley and that's kind of you'll see that in book four also <clears throat> my character Roslyn Langley it's another in your face but these guys have been so caught and so busted uh, so what I really want to talk about today for you guys because I know there's a lot of new members and stuff is kind of what happened to me <clears throat> Excuse me, I have my morning thing. I'm having my latte. So I'm, I'm literally planning to sit back and just talk about this and let it flow. As everybody's favorite shows are just kind of like when we just don't have a direction. <clears throat> but since it's 9-11 and, and really for me, um, now that first book came out in 2014 in November. Uh, I had written it mm, probably in 2011, 12, somewhere in there. And I started looking into... <clears throat> the anomalies and what started me off on this was finding a BBC article from like September 21st 2001 where uh, 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 half a dozen or eight or nine uh, of these hijackers were still alive <laughs> and I was like wait a minute um, and then I started reflecting back on the how the airlines all handled this <clears throat> and how they it, it was the it was a the poison uh, poison pill. You just couldn't talk about it in training. And now in training, you no, know, we go over all the code words. Um, they've all changed by the way, because one of them's in the title now. Maybe I'll call this uh, show captain. I'm being methodical. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> we have these code words that we could, when we call the pilots, uh, and we let them know that there was a hijacker, somebody out of control that want, obviously hijackers want to take command of the plane. They want, you know, to get into the cockpit. So the whole name of the game was preventing uh, the hijacker from getting into the cockpit. Uh, years ago, we used to call it like skirts between, uh, skirts between the cockpit and the hijacker, you know, that you, you just didn't do it. So we had these protocols to follow and whoever that one flight attendant was that he first introduced himself, I want to go to Havana or, <laughs> you know, take me to Havana or, uh, uh, I want to talk to the captain or, you know, shows a gun or a bomb or whatever. That first flight attendant gets him. And everybody else was basically to sit down, just like Dina Burnett said to her husband, Tom, sit down and not draw attention to yourself. What does that mean? So for those of you not in the airline, what that means is like take your uniform wings off, your jacket off. If you had a specific type of uniform blouse, cover it up, uh, put somebody else's coat on, uh, become a passenger and fade away. So he only can deal with that one uh, flight attendant, whoever that was. And so one of the things I saw w when I started looking at this, after I found the hijackers were alive, I went, wait, now this kind of explains why the airline won't talk about this in training. What the heck? Something's wrong. Something's wrong that these guys are falsely accused. The F Saudi government threatened to sue the FBI initially, and I never could find where that lawsuit went or if they just had a huge payoff or exactly how that was handled with the FBI. But now looking back, we have 2020 vision. We know how dirty the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the CIA all are, don't we? We can see it. We're in an ongoing coup against our duly elected president. So looking back now, that's kind of what I wanted to do on this is just kind of talk about how this all happened with me. And this is why uh, I really appreciate um, Marksman Texas in, in the chat room. 
for advising people to read all the books because it's how I woke up in a sense. Now, as a flight attendant, I saw them not follow protocol and I couldn't understand why. And I couldn't understand why the media would make them out to be heroes because they weren't. They didn't do the right thing. <laughs> so then they called all the wrong places, all the weirdest places. I mean, listen, we didn't have any magic uh, powder to get through to any reservations agent quickly. But we did have a number that would be answered quickly called crew scheduling, who had the ability to hook us in with everybody from the CEO right on down the line to the SOC or the security offices that would handle the hijacking dispatch and all of those people. Boom, boom, boom. They've got every number right there. Just push you right on through. Well, you know, when you think about it, uh, since <clears throat> it wasn't happening in real time in the sense that the planes were not being hijacked by uh, Arab passengers, they couldn't call crew scheduling. They couldn't do the things that were necessary for them to do because it wasn't real. They had to yeah. make it up. So they had to do stupid things like call uh, reservations. Yeah. Or, or their spouses. Or their spouses or, or something else because they wanted us to believe what what they were you know what they were trying to sell basically. Yeah. And they were doing a really lousy job. But the horrific pictures that you would see associated with that you believed it. At least I sure. believed it. Oh, yeah, I did too. Until I found the hijackers alive, and that just stopped me in my tracks. And I thought, wait a minute. And then I started to remember that in 2001, uh, 2000, now I just had training, uh, my yearly training. So, <clears throat> and nobody ever said anything about Osama bin Laden trying to hijack planes out of Frankfurt. I just read a, I, I mean, there's just so much goofy stuff going on right now that it's just crazy. That Bill Clinton knew that the 19 Arabs were planning this and the hijackers. Well, th th these guys literally, literally are making a story. And this is judicial watch. So I just kind of lost a whole bunch of respect for them. About a war game. Fake names, you know, that it was supposed to be a representative of Osama bin Laden. You know, some sheik who's part of a, some royal family in the Middle East. It was all just a, 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 a game. A war game. There were lots of them going on that day. And so they've gotten a hold of this document. Now they're blaming the Clintons. And it's just a bunch of political BS. There were no 19 Arabs. And if you, once you grasp that, then you have to ask, well, then, well, who were the hijackers? Well, what was the story all about? And so that's kind of how this happened for me, because then I started driving into this, uh, looking really closely at, well, what did happen and how did it happen? Now, I'm very aware of the flight termination system, the remote control system. Um, and now I'm very aware, and I can talk about this a little bit now, because the person that I, one of the people I, I dealt with that uh, <clears throat> contacted me about um, the company p -Tech, which they've changed their name several times since then. Um, and this was a Middle East-owned Co uh, company, a startup company, Michael Chertoff put, got them involved in the U.S. government. They were into 22 um, U.S. government systems, military, uh, White House, uh, Air Force One communication system, most of the major banks. And this is uh, P-TECH. They had a back door into the Promise or uh, software by Inslaw. You can look all this stuff up. It's real. And so <clears throat> when I, I started to look into that. I remember in the early 90s when Boeing was offering this to every U.S. carrier and United and American bought it. I know that they did because I've talked to people that were instrumental in the whole process. But we were, uh, I remember sitting around and probably I was in Tokyo uh, with some pilots and a crew just as we all go out to dinner and we start talking, well, this whole thing had just come to the surface. And so what they were saying was this, this flight termination system it was kind of a plug-in for the what's it called the flight management system. That's the flight computer that sits between the uh, captain and the first officer on the floor. You, if you walk, look in the cockpit, you'll see this big box on the floor. That's their computer that runs the airplane. That it really basically flies the airplane. So it's kind of like a USB drive. I mean, it's that easy to install this uh, flight termination system. But here's what they said: in the event of a hijacking, well, we had that on 9/11 four times. We can take control of the airplane and land it remotely. 
The only problem is the pilots and the crew in the cabin, the flight attendants, can't communicate. And that's what triggered me at first when Betty Ong said, we, we can't, the pilots aren't answering their phone. And I'm like, well, they must be, must have been taken over remotely. But the reason for that was, I, at least I'm assuming, is that they didn't want anybody to be able to talk outside of the airplane. I mean, in other words, to call the, the uh, flight attendants or to call the ground. Yeah, there was no communication for the pilots at all once that And it wasn't for the, over. for the detriment of the pilots. It was for the detriment of the hijackers. Well, yeah. Uh, it, it's it, well here we had all these questions as the professionals that were losing our ability to communicate because the whole idea of a successful hijacking is to get the plane on the ground to get a hostage rescue team there and rescue all of the the passengers and crew safely and so what do you have to do first you have to communicate how big is the threat what kind of weapon does this guy have these were, this was how the whole code word step-by-step -step process was going on. And so we were taught to recognize the different uh, components of a bomb, for example, how to recognize different types of weapons and that sort of thing. So we could communicate that to the pilots who would then communicate it to the ground. So the hostage rescue people, once we landed, whether they were a SWAT team, SEAL team, FBI, depend upon where you land, uh, they would know what they were up against. So it was a successful thing. That's kind of how this, why this whole thing was, and it was set in stone. We got taught this every year. And so what I started to see then with the two, the first flight, American 11, was the two flight attendants didn't follow protocol. They didn't say the same information. They didn't say the right information. Betty Ong kept saying where she was sitting in her jump seat. That doesn't matter. Now, when you consider they were on, uh, apparently they were on cell phones, which it was impossible. Then they, they tried to claim that Betty Ong's sitting at three right. And she said that, you know, half a dozen times I'm at my jump seat in three right. No air phones reached to that jump seat. And I've had that reconfirmed by gazillions of American flight attendants. Well, I think it's true that captains of airplanes are very, very possessive of the airplane and the passengers. I'd say protective. Well, yeah. protective and, yeah. and, and, and possess yeah. possessive, but they will do whatever it takes. And I think that was the reason they didn't want the uh, uh, termination system is because they lost control. That's and they true. don't like losing control Well, in our in, under any circumstances. And our, our control, so to speak, our success in a hijacking was that communication. So that <clears throat> the ground people knew they were up against a bomb that could go off or they were up against a you know, 45 pistol, or they were up against, um, you know, whatever, box cutters, okay? <clears throat> so that communication was key, and that's why we sat around and said, wait a minute, let's not, you know, the pilots' union wasn't real thrilled with this thing because we lost all forms of communication, and that just stuck with me over the years, and this, I'm going to say this is the late 80s, early 90s, maybe as late as 92, Um the American Airlines called theirs the flight interruption system, I believe. So, you know, they kind of gave it a little name. A lot of pilots don't even know it's on their planes. And after 2006, Boeing started <clears throat> building a uh, an autopilot. Uh, un it's called an uninterruptible autopilot. They patented it in 2006. It's a different system. It wasn't in place on 9-11. Um, but it's like on almost all the Boeing planes now. So when MH370 happened and, and uh, other planes seem to have issues, then you can kind of think, oh, well, I wonder if that's what's going on, which I thought right away with MH370, but that's another story. So I started looking at it because of that Betty's uh, statement that they couldn't get the pilots to answer their phone. But then I started looking closely. I would say 18 minutes after departure, there's no way you would be wanting to call the pilots from the back end of the aircraft. It's 159 feet away from the cockpit door. Uh, and she didn't ever tell the reservations person, well, are, is she the second person? Had she been calling? See, because when you first take off on an air airplane, especially a, a wide body airplane full of fuel, even though the passenger load was kind of light. Uh, Flight 11 had, you know, roughly 90 people, 80, 88 or something with the crew and everything. So it's, you know, had quite a few empty seats still. But you got a lot of fuel to go coast to coast. And so 
uh, the first 18 minutes, I, I'm just going to roughly estimate, don't hold me to this, but you can, next time you're flying, you can watch. The flight attendants basically sit on their hands with their palms up uh, in a brace position in their jump seat for the first five to seven minutes of the flight. And then we're climbing out and it takes, you know, 15 to 20 minutes to reach a relatively comfortable cruising altitude where you're not just being pulled out and walking at a total angle. Now we can get out of our jump seats if you're having a, you know, choking or something and we are having a heart attack or something. We can do that, but it's very uncomfortable and uh, it's not real safe. So we wait till the plane sort of levels off. And it was only like a few minutes after the plane leveled off that she's come calling reservations. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, that just doesn't make sense. So as I started looking at all of those things that didn't make sense, something was wrong, but I couldn't quite figure it out. So in the first book, I thought, and quite frankly, let me just say this honestly, I could not believe that the crew were the hijackers or were, were part of this Shazam. Uh, so I thought, well, they've, they've taken over and they're, they're landing the plane. And then we found, uh, you know, I found that they landed in Westover. And then I found out that the flight time from Dulles and the flight time from Newark matched the time the, the calls were made. You know, as a lay person who, who has nothing to do with airlines, I can understand how maybe the crew could be involved. But why couldn't you, as an airline professional, believe the crew? I mean, why did you just dismiss that completely? Oh, wow, that's my, that's a professional cognitive dissonance, I guess. And when you are in, uh, it's kind of like being a firefighter. When you're in the airline business, it doesn't matter if you're a pilot or a flight attendant. Um, there's two very, very dangerous times in your, uh, in your day takeoff and landing. And that's when most stuff happens. Rarely does anything happen midair, like, you know, MH3, uh, MH17 got blown out of the sky. But rarely does that happen. Uh, the German wings thing also was, you know, kind of at altitude, uh, but it, it's very uncommon. And I'm sure that there was, there's an explanation and it's probably a military explanation for both of those. In general, I mean, there's, most at any given time, there's probably close to between four and 5,000 airplanes in the sky above, above the United States. So you can see that a lot of stuff doesn't happen, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things A to B, but where it's really the most dangerous is on the tarmac, on the runway, taking off and landing. Now, if, if you're taking off or you're landing, you're, com you're coming or going really fast. So if stuff happens, you've got a lot of G-forces you're dealing with. That's why we tell you always be prepared for more than one impact. Brace for impact is our, is our uh, code to tell you. Brace for impact. And when, if we have time to do a planned emergency, we tell you prepare for more than one impact. And it isn't until the pilots hit the microphone and say, easy victor, easy victor, easy victor to us, which is our code word is to evacuate, evacuate, evacuate the airplane. Okay. So then we access our conditions, look out the window and open our doors and, and the slides, inflate the slides, get you out of there if it's possible. So that's kind of how that goes. But that's when it's the most dangerous, right? So that's kind of, these are the things we drill and we drill every year. But we also drilled about um, hijacking. And so what I was seeing is the odd thing about 9-11 was that they, they uh, well, first off, you can't make a cell phone call from altitude and you still can't unless you're on a specially equipped aircraft. So how were they doing this? I mean, if, a, if an air phone didn't reach three right, how was Betty talking to uh, a reservation agent for a half an hour nearly? I mean, 27 to 29 minutes. How did that happen? And then Amy Sweeney, who claimed, they claim, now her boss claims she called from her cell phone and they were personal friends, but the FBI claims she called from a air phone. She was at least in a passenger seat, but she said Betty was sitting next to her. Well, three right isn't near, uh, isn't, is a jump seat. It's not a coach seat. She was from the, in the second to the last row in coach. Okay, then she said uh, 9B was the hijacker. 9B was the special agent, Israeli uh, special agent Sayerat Matt Call, a highly trained assassin, fluent in English. He grew up in Denver, fluent in Hebrew, and fluent in Arabic. And so they want us to believe 
that these two little five foot five, 20 year olds, basically early 20s, hijackers were sitting planning the hijacking, speaking Arabic right behind him. And then they got up and killed him with a plastic box cutter. Yet everybody that spoke highly of him, and they're, they're, they're literally our um, uh, monuments. He's a hero, Daniel Lewin. He went by Daniel Lewis uh, when he moved to Israel with his family. Um, but Daniel Lewin, who was the MIT graduate, is sitting in 9B. He was also a hostage rescue guy. So he knew how everything worked on the plane. And I'm thinking, wait a minute now, there's one mistake a flight attendant would never, ever, ever make. So take this one to the bank. <laughs> we would never claim you were a hijacker uh, to somebody on the ground. Uh, she was happened to be talking to her supervisor. But if you weren't, we would have to be 100% sure. Why is that? Because when then we land the airplane, you're dead. <laughs> you're going to be shot at by the SWAT team or the hostage rescue team, whoever meets us, or Navy SEALs, whatever, FBI. So we would never make that mistake. And I thought, well, well, that's a weird mistake. Now, not only that, they were giving completely opposite details. And this is extremely important that if we were to talk to anybody at any time about anything, that everything is the same story. That it's Because the truth is, is the same. The truth is the same. It doesn't change. You're not at three right and you're not at the, in a passenger seat at the same time. You're one or the other. It's like you're not at 7,000 feet, 10,000 feet, or 5,000 feet at the same time either. You're one or the other, but you can't be at all two or three different places on radar. That was a problem. So I started to see all these problems, you see, and then I started to see, I just went down to the next flight and took the next set of phone calls, which happened to be, first we had this pattern, two flight attendants, then two passengers, and then on the third plane, which was flight 77, one of each. Well, I was, I'm like, wow, this is kind of fascinating. Two, pot, two flight attendants, two passengers, one passenger, one flight attendant, and then a whole bunch of people called on flight 93. So then um, I thought, well, that's really interesting because they came up with the let's roll and somehow Todd Beamer's boss at Oracle, which is kind of an Israeli company, uh, Larry Ellison, he's a Jewish, uh, Israeli, dual citizen kind of guy. I made the mistake of releasing the let's roll story 14 hours before the FBI made it public. How did Larry Ellison know that? And I was like, wait a minute. Then I started to look to see how many of these people had just recently been in Israel or were working for companies that were Israeli. Even on flight 175, there was an, an IDF gal there that worked for allied materials, another Israeli company. Um, so it's kind of fascinating, all these things I started to see. I'm like, wow, pattern, pattern, pattern forming. So when I first wrote the first book, I still thought that the crew couldn't have done this, that, that they used the flight termination system. And I mean, I wasn't, I was pretty sure that there weren't any Arabs on there, but that's kind of what I started looking for then was, well, how, who was behind this? And I, you know, in the second book, it kind of, leads you to who planted all of the bombs. So really what you're saying is it's kind of like you mentioned started or started to say about firefighters. You wouldn't ever suspect a firefighter to be an arsonist, just as you wouldn't expect a flight attendant or a pilot to be a hijacker. That's true. But oftentimes volunteer firefighters are the, are the arsons. It'd be amazed how many times, but anyway, getting back to answer your question a little better. Um, when you're a, a fellow crew member has your back. So if something happens on takeoff or landing and you have a crash, because they do happen, uh, if you get both your legs broken, you want to be sure that somebody on that airplane in your crew, whether you're sitting in a double jump seat with somebody right next to you, or they have to come up from the aft uh, door three right or three left, and they have to come up to uh, door two where you're at, and get you off the plane. As a matter of fact, in a planned emergency, we even assign that to somebody. We have assignments. You help me open the door. You, uh, you know, barricade the aisle till we get the everything open, the chute open, all that stuff. And if I if I'm not coherent, get my body off the plane. We tell somebody that. So we assume that our coworkers have our back. And so when you go in, it's kind of a sort of a buddy thing. Even if it's somebody you've never, ever met 
And this is the case now still. Uh, even though uh, you retire from the airline, you're still in the airline family. And so it's kind of a family unit and it's, it, it truly is very difficult. This is the pill that you can't swallow if you're in, in the industry that somebody would do this. That's actually a, a crew member, pilot or flight attendant. So, um, and that's kind of, once I realized the, uh, you know, as the books proceeded, after the second book was written is when I got contacted by family members who knew the crew member in their family had been offered a job with the CIA. And that's really, had I not had a rather lengthy conversation with an, an adult child of a flight attendant that was involved, I would never have believed it. I, I probably to this day would not have believed it. But what he wanted to know was, did I think that the CIA let his dad stay alive? And uh, I have no way of knowing that. If I use my logic, I think that they would they would definitely keep people that could help them if you, if you had a special skill, like let's just say a highly trained military pilot, which happened to be all eight of them. Uh, one of them was a civil air patrol, and a civil air patrol, just so you know, is where Barry Seal got his start. <laughs> he flew for the CIA, and it is basically the CIA's Air Force. And a lot of guys that don't go through the military... You know, you often hear that all eight of the pilots were military trained. Well, he was civil air patrol. That's really not military, but it is the CIA's Air Force. So take that to the bank. What does that tell you? And we see another person that's got this attachment to the CIA. Now, there's another thing that happened. Uh, I think uh, it's in uh, the third book, Methodical Conclusion now, where there was a pilot. Let's just talk about this guy. Um, because he started out as a, uh, I think he was Civil Air Patrol too, I think is how he started. Uh, he was not a military trained pilot, I believe. Um, but he started out flying for the CIA with Barry Seal. And then he later on uh, got hired by Eastern when they went under, uh, United hired him. There may have been another airline in between that that went under too, but that was kind of the, the trend in the late late 80s early 90s where you know some of the airlines were collapsing so he ended up with united and this guy his name was philip marshall he ended up in i think it was 2013 12 or 13 uh, murdering his two uh, teenage children killing the family dog and then turning the gun on himself however while he was doing this, and no, none of his neighbors heard any shots, which kind of tells you silencer was used, which he didn't have on, his, on the gun they found. Um, but his wife was in Turkey. Interesting. Uh, so this starts to stink like a CIA, doesn't it? When you start to see stuff like that. Um, she conveniently was out of town. But here's the crazy thing. He had written a book, self-published a book called Bamboozle where he claimed 19 radical Muslims were at the helm, even though he knew damn good and well, since he flew seven fives and seven sixes, that the, neither of those airplanes could be flown at five or 700 miles an hour close to the ground or the 270 degree corkscrew turn into the Pentagon without the engines hitting the grass. I mean, he knew that, but he wrote a fake story that was right along with the government's CIA storyline that we're hearing promoted today. So that was called the Big Bamboozle, I believe. And um, then, right before he died, he made the mistake, the Andrew Bartbart mistake. I've got the, I'm, I know what's going on now, blah, 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 blah. And then, boom, he's dead. Okay, so he was, he was, uh, let me, what shall I call it? Digging around a boneyard called uh, Panel. And it's in Arizona. And it used to be... It's in Marana. Marana, Arizona. It used to be a CIA base. But the CIA moved to Mojave. So I don't know if he didn't know that. And I've always questioned this. I'll just do this out loud for you guys because it's true. I question it till, still to this day. Because the air traffic controller that was the working with me that had been working at Edwards Air Force Base... 
knew that the U.S. Airways 757 was flying out VFR every Saturday night for, you know, several weeks, probably six to eight weekends before 9-11 happened was their getaway plane. There was a fuel bladder. Indeed, there was a fuel bladder put into that plane. It was pulled out of, if you've ever seen a boneyard, they kind of park the planes as close to wingtip to wingtip and they're just together. But a friend of his son's... <clears throat> actually worked there and was part of putting the fuel bladder in and had told him about this plane mysteriously being pulled out by a tug out of the lineup and take uh, fueled because he, he was a part of it. He was working there and then took off every Saturday night leading up into 9-11. And before it did take off, a bus would show up and there were what he thought were flight attendants with roller bags and little black suitcases on wheels. And they would get on the plane and then they'd push back and off they'd go. And so he, the air traffic controller, knew about this because the airplane actually had been in a near miss with a Continental 737 outside of Barstow. So when he read the first two books and contacted me, that's when we realized, oh my God, they, ha they actually had... A getaway plane. So the, we knew that there weren't 19 Arabs, but we knew somebody was involved in pretending to be on a hijacked plane, pretending to be and handling the passengers. Well, you gave me an assignment once several years ago to go to Mojave and just try to check some things out that you were interested in. And I have to tell you that Mojave is the most schizophrenic place <laughs> I have ever seen. On the one hand, they're always open to the public. They want to be friendly. They, you know, it's the, you know, the, the town of Mojave is is really not really much of a town. I mean, basically is the airport. Everybody that's read the books wants us to go there because I, I thought I did a good job of, of describing that but, little town. But the thing about it is, is, you know, they, they, you know, they're just very friendly. But if you get actually into the, onto the airbase and you talk to people, everything clams up. They are the most tight-lipped. I mean, they will not tell you anything. If you want information like, where's the bathroom? <laughs> you have to look on the wall to find out, you know, where the uh, the guide is to get to the bathroom because they're not going to talk to you about it. It's it's really the weirdest place I've ever been. It's very interesting um, that it's a, a place that in, uh, experimental planes are flown out of. Uh, there is a CIA uh, base there. Uh, foreign pilots from intelligence agencies come in. And so you'll see all kinds of different uh, different airplanes, anything from a fighter jet. And you might see guys in uh, with uh, flags from other countries, not just us. Uh, there's old ammo bunkers there. And this is what, what happened is these air traffic controllers, they started to watch this plane flying out of visual flight rules. And you can't do that as a commercial plane. And that's why when there was the near miss with the Continental guy, everybody started freaking out. Well, then they watched this pilot, uh, this um, air traffic controller starts watching and it's happening every weekend. And as soon as they get into Vegas, which isn't a very long flight, um, maybe take you about 45 minutes or so from Barstow. Uh, I bet it's not even that long. It's probably... 30. Yeah, that could be. Maybe 20. Yeah. It's, it's very not, short. It's not very long. And they would file a flight plan while they were in the air to Dulles in Washington, D.C., which happens to be one of the airports. And so, um, you know, that was used on 9-11. So we started to see and we thought, well, you know, what could they be doing? Well, they could have been testing radar ho holes and they, you know, they could have been doing all these various different things. So, and we started to look at the radar and the radar holes in the radar. And then we started finding that in the Northeast sector on 9-11, all the way up from uh, uh, North Truro, Cape Cod, all the way up uh, to Maine, the radar was uh, in, uh, inoperative, out of service. And it shows up on the daily logs that are in the FOIA data. Now, I didn't know how to read those. So... <laughs> It's a lot of uh, uh, like uh, abbreviations and code stuff and, and OTS is out of service. Um, so I, I was like, really? And so then uh, he's like, well, let's look at all these, pull all of these up for me. So we started sharing all these files and that's kind of how <clears throat> all the, that came together. But while they were watching this big Russian cargo plane, by the way, 
The Antonov 225, uh, I got a notice on my flight radar 24 the other day, was actually flying relief into uh, somebody that, someplace that just got hit by um, the typhoon. I think some somewhere into Japan, but it can't be Osaka because I think the airport's still closed, but somewhere relief effort stuff. And these here airplanes are huge. So then that was going on at the same time. This gold was being transferred from the World Trade Center Tower vaults into these old ammo bunkers. And so a couple guys, you know, like Jack uh, and Elmer Cooper, uh, they started taking pictures and started sniffing around, but not letting anybody in town know they were doing that uh, because it's a very secretive town, just like you get from Jack and, and Elmer Cooper. Uh, so they, and it, what the townspeople basically try to do is just discredit anything they say. It's kind of like the conspiracy theory tag that the CIA came up with when they killed uh, John Kennedy. And they can't created, you know, if you don't believe the magic bullet, you're a conspiracy theorist. And they discredit you with that title. And so, and that's kind of, that's what's happened. Well, one of the things I found about 9-11 is there were so many uneducated, inexperienced people with no data, no knowledge, no nothing out there making these crazy conspiracies that what happened now, if I came out with the truth, if it wasn't in a novel, but if it's sitting there in a nonfiction, you wouldn't believe it because these people have muddied the water and a lot of them, interestingly enough, I just see patterns a lot. A lot of them happen to be college professors with no background in aviation whatsoever. But what the interesting thing for me is the people that have come forward and shared stuff with me are people that were very aware of the remote control system, the flight termination system that was actually being tested by DARPA at Edwards Air Force Base. And the company P-TECH, what was in the FAA basement on 9-11, was also on Edwards working with this system. They were connected to the system. And so when I connected them, this person said, wow, how did you figure this out? And I'm like, well, I just started digging and I started finding all these things connected and these people connect. And so then they all connected. So after the second book with how uh, we had all those, and people can't believe this day, I, almost once a week, I get somebody that's read this second book, Methodical Deception. And they can't believe that that New York Times article that's in the webpage, methodicaldeception.com, that actually is real that these guys, these artists, and they happen to be uh, Jewish Austrians or Europeans through this Austrian uh, art group from the, uh, they were uh, guests of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Center. They were living on the 96th floor and they had, there's a, even a picture, you can see it. It's a, a temporary construction pass. And according to William Rodriguez, who was one of the main janitors of the World Trade Center complex, they had the run of every building in the World Trade Center complex. Now, just so you know, there wasn't just building one, two, and seven, if you even know about seven falling down, but there was building one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And none of them made it unscathed, but you don't hear about those. But if you go online, and look for aerial photos of the uh, terror attacks, 9-11, something along that line, and go to your images, you can find aerial shots and you can see where it looks like a circular, completely like a donut cookie cutter, was pushed down right into the center of like building four, building six. You can see it, it's obviously they were bombed out, but isn't it interesting that the government's never ever mentioned those other buildings? And they were all bombed out. All of them. Something happened to them. Um, but there's no explanation. They don't even get mentioned. As a matter of fact, in the 9-11 commission hearings, they don't even mention Building 7. Uh, you have to ask yourself, how come? <laughs> how come none of those buildings are mentioned ever? But you can see pictures. You know, it's kind of interesting that there's a lot of stuff that they did not want you to, to even look at or think about ever. Building 7 being one of them. That's why it's not included. So that now when you know, when you look back at all the stuff that happened, the stolen gold, there was uh, the Brady bonds that were expiring, $260 billion worth of Brady bonds expiring September 12th. Oh, they 
the papers all got uh, wiped out. And then the, so I don't know how they laundered all that, but they put the SEC in a, in emergency mode for a couple of weeks, laundered all this fake gold bonds and all this stuff. And this was George H.W. Bush behind the Brady bonds. So there was all kinds of insurance fraud. We I have had people contact me that were insurance underwriters, I think was what they're called. And the um, the employer of like Marshall McLennan, those big companies that were literally targeted that got hit months before, about six months before. Then a lot of people knew this was coming, by the way. This was not something that just happened under Bush and Cheney. This was a long, long planned out event for the reason, the same reason uh, uh, Operation Northwoods was planned to get us into a war. Well, not with Cuba, but with the entire Middle East. And that's why they demonized Muslims. But isn't it interesting that there weren't 19 Arabs on those, there weren't any Arabs on any of those planes. But the FBI, which you now know are liars, you look at what they're saying about the, the sitting president of the United States, and they're getting caught. And when they release all the documents from all of this stuff that they were doing as part of this coup d'etat against Donald Trump, uh, you're going you're gonna to see what liars they are. You're going to get to see all the papers and you're going to, and this is, so you're going to be able to understand. And it's not going to be as hard for you to believe that 9-11 was an intelligence operation and that they had recruited crew members and pass, some of the passengers were put on at the last minute and they also were working for the CIA. You mean they're going to get to see why the FBI is the most corrupt organization in the history of the world and Ex has been for a very long time. Exactly. And I, I think, you know, it's kind of like those people now that are sitting in cognitive dissonance that are non-airline people, a lot of them are people that are Vietnam vets and people that have gone to or lost children and their kids signed up right after 9-11, went to Afghanistan, Iraq and were killed, maimed or came back and suicided themselves. There's all kinds of people right now because they, they need to believe that the Arabs, Muslims did this because they need to hate on them because they're being manipulated. They don't even see it. Uh, the MK Ultra program is very real. And I, I, if you've ever seen the Born, Jason Bourne and the Born Identities and those, those movies, that's basically what uh, part of what they really don't tell you about those movies is that he was in a mind control program by the CIA. Well, if it's so important that the uh, Arabs be blamed for this and that they recreate Groundhog Day every 9-11, why hasn't Khalid Sheikh Mohammed ever been prosecuted? I mean, it's 17 years, yeah. basically, that he's been in Gitmo. There's one word. That and he's going to be there for the rest of his life, obviously. Here's why. Discovery. That's the reason. Because he could bring in all of his discovery. And they don't want you to discover the truth. That's, that's it right there in a nutshell. So basically he's in jail to keep him shut up. Yeah. And so it, it's interesting. I also read that um, Mohammed Atta was um, murdered, taken out, killed. And I believe it was 2005 or six, eventually. And I'm sure that um, because he was working for the Mossad, according to his parents, and they both had spoken with him after 9-11. So how did he do that? <laughs> okay. Well, he wasn't on the planes. He wasn't on any of the planes. Do you ever ask yourself, how did those paper passports make it? And isn't it odd that only two passports survived, two crash sites, and they happened to both be supposedly terrorists? Mm-hmm. You do believe that? <laughs> seriously okay there's some other really crazy stuff that's out there about um some stuff and i i i'll probably end up putting all this together in a non-fiction because you really just need to read it in as a as a story of what they're telling you it's a real story that they're telling you just like today they're telling you that this really happened it didn't now somebody asked me um a question about well, you know, if I talked about the crew members that did this, if they're still alive, they could be killed. Ask me if I care. Because they didn't care that 250 or so passengers were killed. 
And there were a lot of people that just happened to be getting on those planes going from A to B. Grandmothers, children. The one thing there wasn't were pass riding flight attendants. They were all denied passage, said the planes were weight restricted, and you don't restri weight restrict an airplane that isn't completely full. Unless you're leaving out of someplace like Phoenix, and then the plane doesn't have to be completely full, but if it's full of fuel and a pretty heavy load and it's real hot, like 125 outside, uh, they can restrict weight restrict that plane if it's like an Airbus or something. But other than that, you just don't, this is just nonsense. But they didn't want any real flight attendants that didn't, weren't a part of the game. That's why they were denied boarding. And it happened a lot. And a lot of them have contacted me. Some of them even have the real passenger manifest still. Uh-huh. Yeah. And guess what's not on the passenger manifest for those flights that these pass riding flight attendants were denied boarding because of weight restriction? There are no Arabs. So who did it? So that's kind of what happened for me. I just kept uh, going down the line. One of the things that... Um, I found really fascinating is that one of the flight attendants for United had told her a military father and mother that she was in a special terrorist training at United uh, for the weeks leading up to 9-11. And uh, there was no terrorist training. Uh, in the airline, uh, there was just your yearly recertification thing. We didn't use the terminology terrorism or terrorist. It was always a hijacker always in all of aviation so you don't have imagine how surprised i was when i got the foia data and i found a timestamp of a terrorist voice it's that's what it's labeled terrorist voice i think it might even have a one on it that was uploaded to the faa uh, headquarters computer at 6 37 a.m on the morning of 9 11 2001 an hour and a half before flight 11 pushed back how did they know how did they know an hour and a half before pushback that Flight 11 was going to have not a hijacker, as the FAA would have called him, but a terrorist? And why in the world did they ever put a copyright on it? Because it's all right there. And I think there's a photo, a screenshot, you know, kind of a JPEG photo in the back section of Methodical Deception. So you can see. I think I even put an arrow there so you can see the timestamp. Now, um... This is what's really amazing because I have these chronologies, all of these like timelines, and there's a lot of them from the FAA headquarters and the FBI got all the tapes and they didn't give them to the F, uh, FAA for a long time. So how did they, how did this get put into the FAA computer in Washington, D.C. at their headquarters at 6.37 a.m. an hour and a half before the flight ever took off? Well, there was two companies there, MITRE, M-I-T-R-E, and PTAC in the basement of the FAA. And they were in there for a couple reasons. But one of them was they were working on uh, being able to show radar blips. They could make anything appear and disappear on the entire military and commercial system. It's all the same radar for the war games. How convenient. Do you think maybe? MITER and PTEC might have been involved in this? Yeah, <laughs> hugely. And just so you know, in case you don't know, NIST, who said there was a pancake collapse of the towers, is a, a subdivision of MITER. They basically are a shadow government. You can look them up on, if just Wikipedia will give you a lot of information on them. But it's kind of interesting. So by the third book, we found the gold. We found a getaway plane. We found the radar had been shut down of uh, exactly when it needed to be for that getaway plane and to you leave. you found the speckled trout. The speckled trout. That was a uh, 707 that had been actually put together at Edwards Air Force Base. Imagine that. Um, there's a reason that my fourth book is dedicated to the person that it is. <clears throat> because I, at the time we were discussing all this, we didn't realize how he really was the missing piece. He had all this information. He had actually <laughs> worked at Edwards when they were putting the speckled trout together. The speckled trout was right where Flight 11 lost communication. 
in Western Massachusetts at the same time I have their flight plan from Andrews Air Force Base, exactly where Flight 11 fell off their radar and lost communication with air traffic control, the speckled trout was there. Now, since he knew this plane because he'd worked on it and he knew everything it could do, said they could have done all of the remote takeover if that's what they did and landed that airplane from using the speckled trout. Or they could have wiped it off the radar. They could have just made it disappear to the air traffic controllers. They could have just made the blip go away, just like we know P-TECH and MITRE could have done as well. So uh, they, th this airplane is pretty fantastic. It's out, actually retired, but you can find a lot of information about the speckled trout online still. So if you're into aviation and and that, but just so you know, and here's an interesting thing. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Hugh Shelton, who was on that plane, in his book, lied about where they were. I have their flight plan. I can tell you exactly where they were when all of this started. They were still in the United States. He claimed they were halfway to Europe, but that's not true because I know what time they left Andrews and I know how far they could get and I know all their waypoints. So he's a liar. Why would he lie? Probably because the speckled trout was a part of this. Well, here's another thing the speckled trout could do because he claimed that they were over the center of the Atlantic circling all day. But then later on, he says he flew over New York City coming home at uh, around noonish, noontime, maybe 1130, right after the second tower had fallen. Well, let's say noon. But he didn't land, because I have his flight plan and his landing, he didn't land at Andrews until 4.40 in the afternoon. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> that's not a very long flight from New York <laughs> to Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. and uh, right across the river. So, okay, how did that work? So the guy's a liar. Why would he be lying? Well, here's another thing that the speckled trout could do. They could have helped, and they did, the getaway plane not show up on radar, and uh, navigate its way across the Atlantic. Yeah, so it's really fascinating. You have to ask yourself, why did General Shelton lie about everything? From, from everything, from the time he landed, where he went, what he saw at the Pentagon, everything he said is a lie. And he's written this big book and some big publishing company gave him, you know, probably tens of thousands of dollars up front to write his lie. Well, <clears throat> not only is he lying, but two people that were on the speckled trout with him have written stuff too. And they're, none of their stories mesh. So when you see stuff like this, and then you later on find out what's in book four, uh, and that uh, Mary Carter character, you'll uh, start to put the pieces together. And then you'll understand why General Shel Hugh Shelton was lying. And why his crew were lying. Because the truth is only one thing. It isn't three different stories. Now, it just isn't. Sorry, it just doesn't take that long to go from New York City to Andrews Air Force Base. Trust me. So how long does it take? Hmm, maybe about an hour, give or take five or ten minutes. It depends on your headwinds or tailwinds. But, um, so yeah, it's really interesting. So when I found, and it's, it's fascinating, all this weird stuff that I just started finding. Now, when I got uh, book uh, one, the methodical illusion done, and I, I, that's kind of when stuff started happening on a, hmm, I don't know if I saw, call it a spiritual level or a, it's almost a psychic level, but I'm not a psychic. But like when I would be in the shower, I would be getting messages a lot or running water in the kitchen sink or somewhere where there's running water. And I would literally get uh, a message to go down this rabbit hole or to look at this. And that's kind of how the rest of the books continued to flow. As, as I was waking up to the fact that, oh my God, you know, that in order to make the phone calls, they had to have been on the ground. That was the first thing I looked, really looked at. And I knew they needed a 10,000 foot runway. So where do they, you're going to find that within 20 uh, minutes of flight time from Boston. So I found it. And then people from that base, that was a reserve base, started contacting me. They weren't allowed to be on the base. They were called up, activated. And that was a logistics base. They flew a lot of what's called a C5 Galaxy Transport, and they are larger than a 747. You can go on the Westover Air Force Base um, website. You can look it up on Wikipedia and click onto their websites in that box part on the right-hand side. 
click on there and go to photos and you can see. And now remember when Betty Ong said he stood upstairs, you'll see the stairs in the hangers. And that's kind of another thing when the details that I found, I found multiple 302s on Betty Ong's four and a half minutes of taped conversation. Now, until recently, I didn't know 302s couldn't change. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute, I've got, I printed them out. So I know I have them. Um, and I printed a lot of stuff out. I have boxes of stuff because I didn't trust that the, and part of the reason was that I was advised to also do this um, by several people that had intelligence background, print it because it may disappear from the internet. That's how history is rewritten. So that's kind of what's, you know, one of the things I have, it just, it is. Well, one of the things that I saw with Betty Ong's stuff is that she said things that were just not, <laughs> they were not protocol for, for one thing, but not only did she say he stood upstairs, he sprayed pepper spray or mace. If you do that in a pressurized cabin, we just saw what happens on the Hawaiian Airlines flight from Oakland, California uh, to Hawaii. Uh, people get sick. And so then we heard on United 175, uh, Peter Hansen said that they'd sprayed pepper spray or mace and people all around him were vomiting and getting sick, but he wasn't. He didn't have any trouble. He didn't cough. His dad said, no, he just was talking. But he also, both those guys, both of the men who called, the passengers were two men from row, I believe they were both in row 31, one on the left aisle, one on the right aisle. And, um, they both didn't know where they were. One of them was actually a pilot or a radar intercept officer, I should say, because I found out from his actual pilot's wife that he wasn't really a pilot. He was the backseat guy. He was a radar intercept officer. Think about that. He was a radar intercept officer. Could he have had a laptop that could have intercepted uh, the uh, transponder? Maybe. But he looked out over Newark International Airport from five to 7,000 feet. Now, if you're under 10,000 feet, you know, you can't use your electronic devices. He's looking out and he tells his mother on the telephone that he's over Ohio. Trust me, you can't dis you just can't mistake Manhattan out one side of the plane, the Manhattan skyline, the Hudson River, the Statue of Liberty is right there, and Newark International. Everybody knows it. It's right there. And it was four miles across the river from the Twin Towers. <laughs> so how could he be that confused? Uh, he lived in the Boston area, by the way. Uh, so, you know, you started to see this stuff that just doesn't make any sense. The other guy who called, he told his dad that the he thought, I don't know, why would he think this, that the hijackers were going to hijack the plane. Now, keep in mind, this thing's about five to 7,000 feet off the ground. That's like on your final descent. That's when the, pat the flight attendants are coming by and making sure your seat belt's fastened and your tray table's stowed, right? Are you ready? Is everything aisle at your feet clear? That's what we're doing then because we're preparing for a landing. Neither one of them said anything about that. They thought they were in Ohio. And the other guy said to his dad, he thought the hijackers were going to fly the plane to Chicago and fly it into a building. Who told him that? Because... I mean, this was like a 10 minutes after something had hit the North Tower. And this is just crazy. How did this guy not recognize Newark if he was that close to the ground and a pilot? Well, guess what? At that point, I started to say, wait a minute. And then NTSB and the FAA radar files, when I say to you between five and 7,000 feet, you can only be five or seven. You can't be both. You can't be either or. Guess what? People will crash into each other in the sky. It's much more precise than that. So I started to see holes and problems. And that's when I started to look, when was this file uploaded to the FAA headquarters? And the meta tags were, <laughs> were before the crash, before takeoff. Uh, were, they were before the whole event some of, in some cases, like the voice file of the terrorist voice. And that's really when I went, oh dear, this is just, a, it was a complete and total fraud, a hoax, a complete and total hoax on the people of the world. Why? Look and see what happened. Go back, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. What did we get out of this? Who, who, who benefited, right? Did anybody benefit? 
Well, interestingly enough, they claim that 15 of the hijackers that really weren't on the plane were Arab, uh, were uh, Saudi Arabian. But Saudi Arabia actually benefited because the Bin Laden construction company got the contracts to build a lot of our military bases throughout the Middle East, and there's lots of them now. Yeah, Bin Laden's family construction company, they are part of the Carlyle Group, as with the George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush, who was the president at the time, got the contracts to build Wendy's and McDonald's and Air Force bases all around everywhere. But, uh, but, 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 but wait a minute now. 15 of the accused hijackers were Saudi Arabians. How did that work? How did we end it? Wait, wait a minute now. Bin Laden did this from a cave in Afghanistan. How in the world did, did the president of the United States and his father turn around and give the Bin Laden construction company tens of billions of dollars in con construction costs uh, and projects? How, how did that happen? Can anybody make that make any sense, right? No. Okay, so one of the things I put in methodical illusion is, and this happened to me too, uh, is that you know, after 9-11, they formed the Department of Homeland Security, and under that was the uh, Transportation Safety Administration, TSA. And those are the guys with the blue gloves that mishandle you when you try to get on a plane now. Well, bef there was a transition period before that where they literally hired, I don't look like college kids to me, but then I was a little older. Uh, but the, nobody knew what they were doing. And there were two things that were going on. One is they were going through all the flight crew's luggage right in front of you at the gate area on a table. And two, they had a little team that would go through uh, the airplane. But then we would get on the airplane as part of, because we didn't know. I mean, we, we all were told the same thing everybody else was. But we were taking it damn serious. We looked. We'd already, they'd paid for these kids. And I do believe some of them were college kids. Um, to uh, look at all kinds of areas in the cabin, seat pockets, you know, like the seat pocket in front of where the magazine is and the barf bag used to be. We would find CD players, CDs, all kinds of stuff after these kids, they just walked through the aisle. They didn't do anything. So I started to see, wait a minute, and then TSA started up and what happened? I'm seeing women wearing hijabs, not just working for the TSA, but now at the hot dog stand. Yeah, pork hot dogs, right? You know, hot dogs and, you know, popcorn or whatever, the snack bar, the magazine bar. And, and every airport I started going to in, in the United States, I saw more and more hijab wearing women. Uh, I saw a guy in uh, uh, one U.S. city uh, if working for the TSA, his name literally, and he was obviously, <laughs> he was obviously an Arab. Uh, his name was Muhammad. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Now this is crazy. You, the official story, and I was believing it at the time, but this is why it didn't make any sense. And this is why they hired these people because 9-11 was a fraud. There were no Arabs there. They just wanted you to hate them. So you would sign up and go fight their wars for oil and heroin, and natural gas. Well, and, and there's a couple other things like lithium. Lithium's great for those electric car batteries, uh, for the batteries that are in cell phones and that sort of thing, and Afghanistan happens to be full of it. So there's lots of reasons, but it's mostly all natural resources and dope, because that's, that's what makes the world go round. So now we're starting to see things that <laughs> that's going on right now. Remember the Iran-Contra affair? You know, learn about that a little bit more in book four also, where we were selling arms. And the, these were um, black ops people, uh, a lot of black ops people that were selling illegal to sell uh, arms to the Sandinistas or the Contras. And the Sandinistas were the terrorists. We hated them. They were the ISIS of their day or the Al Qaeda. We are actually now working with Al Qaeda. So the official 9-11 story was Al Qaeda did this. But we literally, and you can look this up, we literally are offering, we are the Air Force for the Al-Qaeda. Well, you know, I think of all my, all the stories that you've told, my favorite is the fact that you actually met somebody that was in 
a special ops program that was in Afghanistan right after 9-11. And more than once, they had Osama bin Laden in their gun sights and couldn't get permission from the top. And we're not talking about the sergeant in the corner. We're talking about somebody in the White House yep. couldn't get permission to shoot which means that they didn't want Osama bin Laden dead. That's because Osama bin Laden was a CIA asset. Are you starting to see the, the one common thread through all of this talk about 9-11? He was a CIA asset. Remember the CIA pilot that killed his kids and his dog and himself? The CIA pilot that worked with Barry Seal running uh, drugs up back in the United States from Central America? Arms? the Iran-Contra, the whole thing. Yeah, he was one of the CIA pilots. So if he was a hit job, it was the CIA that killed him because he knew too much. He knew the involvement of the Bush family for sure. Uh, and I knew uh, from someone else that he had pictures that were pretty damning of, uh, in particular, Jeb Bush. So Jeb was going to be the president, remember? And well, they needed to make sure that guy never spoke. But uh, there's probably a lot more to that guy's story than we'll ever know. But I think his wife could have even been CIA because, interestingly enough, she was in Turkey uh, when his, when her kids got murdered. Um, but, yeah, it's it's kind of fascinating to, to look back and, and to see all this stuff. And then the people that have come forward uh, that shared their stories. And there's a lot of those in book four. There's a lot of history. And the reason I wrote book four was to just show you if you're still in cognitive dissonance and you still are having a hard time thinking whether you're airline crew or not, whether you're just a passenger or just a public person, that there's no way our government could have done this. Just look at their history. And a lot of it's right there in big print and it's been declassified. So it's not my story. It's their story. It's proof that they, they have a history of this kind of stuff. The arms for... Um, Arms for Drugs deal. Uh, this was Pan Am 103 got caught up in, in uh, a heroin deal. Uh, same kind of thing. I think Benghazi also was a uh, arms deal gone sideways. And now you have to understand that the intelligence uh, operations that do this arms and drugs exchange were not the only one. It's not just the CIA. The Mossad's involved in this too. I'm sure MI6 is as well. And one of the things that I found, and I think this is in Methodical Conclusion, when you meet Chip, Microchip, as he calls himself, but so people can remember his name, um, Chip as in Microchip, he says, uh, is that um, all of the intelligence agencies work together and they work together to pull off a stunt like 9-11 and to cover it up. All of them work together. And so they all benefited. So if you look to see who benefited, well, the oil companies, and look and see who, who are the politicians involved in oil companies. Like I'm ha talking uh, KBR, Halliburton, uh, Genie Energy. I mean, there's a gazillion of them. And just look and see. And they, you don't have to go very far to look at the John F. Kennedy assassination and the people involved in the oil there. So if the FBI ever changes their name, they're going to call themselves the CYA? <laughs> that would be very Got fitting. Me having it, a sip of my latte. Would it not? Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe if <laughs> if Trump uh, figures out how to dissolve this, I think we're going to see a very interesting week. I decided this would be kind of a fun uh, show to just talk about the nine eleven stuff. I'm trying. I'm trying to think about all the questions that people have asked me. Um, yeah, the first thing that happened ever was when I found the hijackers still alive. And a lot of them either had their ID stolen or had never, ever been in the United States. And it's a BBC article from September 21st. You can still find it online. That was my first sip of the truth. And I just said, well, wait a minute. Now, this was probably in 2007, 8, somewhere in there, maybe the beginning of 2009 that I stumbled across that and started to really look. Well, the other thing you, I don't think you've mentioned is all the eyewitnesses that actually saw the planes land in Westover. That's and, pretty amazing. And there's a, there's one in methodical deception and that is a word for word of a signed notarized affidavit. She is definitely willing to go uh, speak to Congress. 
Um, but yeah, there's like five of them now. And these are people who uh, live in, lived at the time in Western Massachusetts. Uh, some of them aren't still in the same locations. So, but at the time they lived in um, Lee, Stockbridge, Otis, uh, Pittsfield, in that area. It's w which is west of Westover, but they were used to seeing airplanes coming in. And now keep in mind, Westover was a reserve base. So a lot of their traffic was, um, you know, weekend traffic or that summer traffic when the guys do their two weeks uh, of training and stuff. But they also flew these really large C-5s and they're bigger than a 747. And I know that because they flew a lot of military charters. And we'd bring a 747-100 in, uh, the original airplane, or a 200. Uh, and that was the one with, without the big extended hump on the top like the 400 has. And the guys always liked to show us that. They had a bigger airplane than we did because they always called our plane the 747. So, uh, But I gosh, actually got to tour through uh, a C-5 um, and they really are huge. And if you go to Westover and look or go uh, on Google Earth uh, to see Westover Air Force Base, uh, you'll see these gigantic hangars. And some of the hangars there, most of them, are large enough to pull a C-5 into. So they're really huge buildings. And guess what they have in the corners? Yeah, stairs. So when Betty Ong says to the reservations person, we're the first, I'm like, wait a minute, how would she know that? At 20 minutes after 8, how would she know that somebody must have told her the whole scenario? She had to have been briefed, just like the guy that said he was over Ohio. Well, where was Flight 93? Over Ohio, right? So, and then also, I this took me a while to find, but that same guy, the radar intercept officer, who told his mother, looking at Newark International Airport, that they he thought they were over Ohio, that same guy also said that he was talking to a group of passengers and they were going to take over the cockpit from the hijackers. This is now less than three minutes before supposed impact, but they didn't even know where they were. He didn't even know what was supposed to be out his window, which told me he wasn't even on the plane, the plane wasn't even there. That's when I started to look into the meta tagging and found out that this, this whole thing is faked. This is just nuts. And so uh, the fact that this guy said the scenario, let's roll from flight 93, I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. He also has been told the whole scenario, not just Betty Ong. And then Peter Hansen, the other guy, row 31 on United 175, he tells his dad, he thinks they're going to fly to Chicago and fly into a building. Well, who would have thought that? Because he had no way of knowing this. They took off at 814 from Boston. There's no way they would have known what happened in New York just 10 minutes before. Who told him that? And remember what happened in Chicago? The Sears Tower or the Willis Tower, it's called, was evacuated that morning in Chicago. Yeah, just like he said. Well, was something supposed to happen there, but it didn't? Possibly, because I've had people from a June 2001 uh, intelligence, it's called an OPSEC meeting, O-P-S-E-C meeting, that were told that there were six targets, and that meant there would be six aircraft that were commandeered or made to look like they were in this case, and something happened. Now, having flown the 757 quite often, I can tell you this, a lot of times you get the passengers all loaded up, they shut the door, the pilots go to start the engine, and there's a hydraulic leak that shows up. That hydraulic leak is often a 45 minute delay. And it's more common than you can imagine on the 757 in particular. So I don't know, um, I, I believe that Delta 1989 was one of the other aircraft. I don't know for sure which the other one was, but I'm kind of having a feeling it was one of the US airplanes just for various reasons. I just haven't found it yet. But, um, and the reason I say Delta 1989 is I've found nothing happened on that plane. It was landed in Cleveland, um, but there's a lot of mysterious things around what happened to the crew members afterwards. Yes, I'm in contact with some. Uh, and also um, how that whole thing was handled, how the FAA headquarters convinced the pilot 
who was having his breakfast that they had a hijacker and then he said no we don't everything's cool here we don't have any problems because the flight attendants are serving breakfast and then they said no you've got a bomb on board and that that's not how it works the faa headquarters doesn't know any of that stuff that's not that's just not the protocol that's not how the information gets to the faa it just is like not right not right okay so that plane probably had another you know five or ten handlers cia people that were going to be fake hijackers and part of the crew may have been as well most likely so it's interesting too that i found out that the, the first officer on delta 1989 immediately quit now just so you know this if you're not in the airline first officers never quit they want to be a, a left seat captain on whatever aircraft they can. If they even have to go down to a smaller aircraft to get into that left seat, that's what that's the driving force of every pilot. It's just not right. And so I'm pretty convinced that right now that Delta 1989 was one of the other airplanes that was supposed to be looked like it was commandeered. Something happened. Now at the time it took off out of Boston for LA um, at 824. So about the time it would have been um, over Westover, either they had a ship change and they 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 couldn't uh, pull it down, or the captain maybe had rethought, or maybe wasn't in on it, or something. There was some reason that something didn't happen. It didn't work. At the same time, the Secret Service called supposedly, but this is really the Secret Service. But somebody made a call to CNN claiming they were Secret Service that claimed a commercial plane crashed into Camp David. That never happened. Nothing <laughs> crashed into Camp David. But um, so. I know that was supposed to be one of the other targets, but these intelligence guys, they were told by people like Tommy Franks and above that, that this would happen. They didn't tell them when, that in the near future, and that they knew, now they didn't tell us, anybody in the airline, but they knew, these intelligence people, that there would be six targets. So I think maybe the Sears Tower was supposed to look like a target. I don't know. It sounds like somebody told Peter Hansen 175. Now, okay, so we've got these two men calling in from 175. We also have the one certain FBI or a CIA uh, worker who was a flight attendant who was a black belt in several forms of martial arts on that same airplane. Why do you suppose he did nothing when his own children said he could kill any human being with his bare hands? Much like the guy in 9B who his, co his friends from uh, Israeli Defense Forces and the Sayeret Metcal said that he could kill any human being with a pen and a credit card. That's right out of Jack Bauer 24. <laughs> well, they show actually showed that. They showed, uh, I think, Nina Myers kill somebody on an airplane with a credit card. Mm -hmm. And they showed somebody in a jail cell killing somebody with a pen. Yeah. So they used that because they knew that was the scenario. Yeah, well, it's a, something that Sarah and that call, they are highly trained assassins. And he was in 9B. And it was Amy Sweeney who at first said, the hijacker is in 9B. Now, for some reason, after her first phone call, she called back and later on, and she made two or three calls and some of them dropped and blah, blah, blah. Uh, said, oh, I made a mistake. No, no flight attendant would make that mistake, I'm telling you. And that was a huge red flag for me to find out that not only did this guy, because he was a highly trained assassin, fluent in Arabic, and we we're supposed to believe that there were Arabs sitting behind him talking about, okay, we're going to take over the cockpit now. Blah, 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 so however they say it. And then uh, he can't hear him. Well, you know, just think back for a second. The last time you flew on an airplane, didn't you hear those two people behind you talking about whatever the heck they were talking about the whole time they were talking? Because when you're sitting in an airplane, you're facing forward, you're facing the, the, the guy right in front of you, you're about 18 inches away, maybe, and your voice is carrying right to their ears. Okay, so this is just a little bit of experience, because I did commute from coast to coast, so um, I, I've had lots of experience. Um, being kept awake by people talking from the seat right behind me in every class of service. <laughs> it's not something that just happens at coach. 
Uh, yes, and I've had that child kicking in the back of my seat the whole time as well. So, um, but yeah, you know, using all that experience um, and putting logic together, then I then I started just kept going and I just kept going. And you know, part of the part of the time uh, that I just kept on going was really that people that call that that contacted me through email, and then we'd set up some sort of uh, phone chat or something on Skype or something. Uh, their stories. I, it's incredible because uh, you know what, once I found out that this was a, um, a Shazam, <laughs> it was a hoax. It wasn't even true. And it made total sense why the crew wasn't following protocol. They didn't want this to stop. They wanted it to look like a hijacking. So, you know, people ask me how many of those people do I think are still alive? I know a few of them are, but I mean, you have to look at it logically. If you were, if you cut a deal with the CIA and you were a flight attendant, did you have something special that that they might use later? Were you, you know, some some well trained something or other? If you were, they might keep you around. If you were a pilot, they definitely would keep you around. And if you were a pilot that was involved in the Pentagon for 20 years too, they definitely would keep you around. Now, here's another coinky dink, and then I'll, this is probably enough 9-11 for you guys because I know it's a long story. But there's lots of stuff, and I'm really excited to hear everybody's reaction to book four. But here's another coinky dink for you coming from Max Hager. The captain on flight 77, 757 that supposedly hit the Pentagon worked in the Pentagon for 17 years. One of the things he did when he worked in the Pentagon was he created war games. One of the war games that he created, and you may see that people are denying this, but it's the truth. He wrote a war game of a scenario of a 757 aircraft commercial striking the Pentagon. And guess who supposedly was at the helm of Flight 77? Yeah, that same guy. Hmm. What do you think the chances of that coinky dink are? Slim to nothing? Yeah. Or less. I mean, really, seriously. Now, if you believe that a guy who is a Israeli Jack Bauer could be killed by a plastic box cutter when, he, when everybody that knew him said he could kill any human being with a pen and a credit card who was listening to the hijackers that weren't on the plane <laughs> talking about it, taking over the cockpit, and on the way they slice him and supposedly kill him, but then the flight attendant said he was the hijacker. Both of those flight attendants on that one uh, plane referred to the hijacker as just one person, one guy, a he. So what, how do you explain that, you know, the official story says there was like four or five. How do you explain that? Because a flight attendant that's well-trained and both, both of those gals were, you know, at least a dozen years seniority, they would have said <laughs> how many there were. <laughs> they wouldn't have just said he's a he, the hijacker's a he. He sprayed pepper spray. How do you explain that when we just saw Hawaiian Airlines have a pepper spray accident that got sprayed in a cabin that was pressurized and 15 people got taken to the hospital? How do you explain that on 9-11, it only sat in business class? You can't because the plane couldn't have been pressurized now, could it? I'm so glad. You know, somebody wrote to me and they thought that this was somebody had heard one of my videos and thought, I'm going to bring pepper spray on my flight. Uh, I don't know if they did, but they tested it and they found out that 9-11 was just nothing but a lie on top of another lie, on top of another lie, on top of another lie. And so when people ask me, why did you write this? I want you to know this. The one thing that I kept through my mind through the whole series is this. Things are not always as they seem. So you need to be aware Things are not always as they seem. I actually took a really fun scene out of the first book because it's centered all around that particular message. But that is the, the message I want everybody to walk away with is uh, that things are not always as they seem. And so, you know, I look, sometimes I look now, and especially today, you're going to see all kinds of the official story, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, out there and probably they'll do some fundraisers for some of these pilots that are still alive, you know, because they're such heroes, right? Because they for, they failed to squawk 7,500. What make those guys heroes? Only the media. Because if you don't know what they were supposed to do, you don't know they really weren't heroes. But there is, there's a reason for all of this now. This is the, it's Operation Mockingbird and it is programming you. It's just a form of MK Ultra mind control. But they did, they've done the same thing, and it's a pattern. You're going to see it over and over. And when you finish book four, you're going to contact me and say, I see the pattern now. And you're really going to see what's really currently going on in the United States under the coup. We're, and we're currently involved in a coup, a coup d'etat. And it's exactly what they've done in Iran and Guatemala and Honduras and Rwanda. Everywhere they've done all these coups, they've done the same thing. And you're seeing it happen right here in our very own country. They take over the schools. And it, it isn't something that happens over a weekend or a week or even a month. It takes decades. They take over the schools. They start teaching uh, against the form of government that they're, that's currently there that they want to overthrow. They take over the media. So the media will take them. And they take over the police department so that the police don't protect the civilians when the uprising begins. Think of Antifa and Black Lives Matters. That's kind of stuff that's going on right now. You're going to see it all. I know you are because um, it's big print now. So that's enough for today. I just wanted to give you guys some solid, something solid. And you know what? Since all the conspiracy nuts have muddied the water, who would believe this? That's, that was their job. And they've succeeded. But there is proof. And the one of the main things that is the proof of this is something they never even thought of. And it's just one of those tiny things like the cell phones not working at altitude, that when you save a document on a computer, it does a meta tag. It's a time and date stamp. So when you see a voice file, a WAV file or an MP3, time stamped at 6 37 a.m on 9 11 tagged as a terrorist voice you know there's something wrong with this picture don't you <laughs> i do okay so that's kind of stuff that i started to see and that's why nothing is uh nothing is uh, one particular altitude or one particular time uh, flight 93 has probably 10 different uh moments in time that they say it crashed so, um, and Betty Ong's, uh, did her call start at 8, uh, at 8, 18, 8, 19, 8, 20, or 8, 21? Because there's, if you look, you find all those time slots, but it only ha could happen at one particular moment in time if it were real. So they muddy the waters with a lot of uh, details. It's kind of like what they did with the magic bullet. We were told Kennedy was killed by a magic bullet that hit him and the governor and went all over Hell's Half Acre from the depository through a tree and so for 50 years we were told the magic bullet and if you thought anything else you were a conspiracy nut that's the cia for you so anyway i hope you enjoyed this show and, and i'll i'll uh tag it something about 9 11 so i can take it off and put it over there so other people can listen to it later if you have any questions just put it in the chat room